Yo, what's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel, Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nicholas, coming to you live from California, the first episode out here on the West Coast. A lot of good stuff for week 13 fantasy football. The playoffs are right around the corner. We need to bring the heat. I need to bring the noise. I need to make sure y'all come home with a few chips this year. So as usual, we'll hit those injuries. I'll tell you to subscribe to my newsletter on my website, bdgeat.com. Scroll down to the homepage, put your info in, and tomorrow when I release my wide receiver, cornerback, notable matchup sheets for the week, you'll get an email since you're part of the newsletter. What else are we going over? My top starts of the week, my top sits of the week. If you didn't already check out my waiver wire piece that has my, obviously my favorite waiver wire dudes, along with my top streaming defenses, my murky running back sheet, all that's available, and make sure you're signed up for the newsletter because you'll get an email when those drop, when those go up on the website. I want to get right into this because there's a lot of info for me to hit. So let's get it. All right, so we're going to run through the quarterbacks first and their injuries. We have Paxton Lynch. Link, Paxton Link. Imagine you had two X's, that'd be kind of swaggy. He'll be out two to four weeks with a high ankle sprain, which means Trevor Simeon, the god, will be back under center for the foreseeable future. Now, in eight games a season, right, Trevi Trev has been averaging 227 passing yards, 11 to 10 touchdown to interception ratio. What we see here is a big split in road versus home games for Simeon. Listen to these numbers. At home this year, He's averaging 23 fantasy points per game. However, on the road, he's averaging 12.3 fantasy points per game. That's over 11 fantasy point difference, road versus home. In Simeon's eight games this year, I looked at the target share numbers. So what does this mean for the wide receivers now that Simeon's back under center? Demarius Thomas has seen 27% of the targets with Simeon under center. Sanders, 19 and a half. Benny Fowler, 16. AJ Derby, 11. Sanders has missed some time, so those numbers are going to be skewed a little bit, but that shows that Demarius Thomas is very, very, very much used in this offense, right? 27% is one of, got to be one of the highest numbers of target percentage in the league. Regardless, um, that AJ Derby number being 11% is worth noting because between Derby and Virgil Green, uh, they've seen 17.5% of Simeon's targets, and obviously A.J. Derby's on the IR. Jeff Sherman, or however you say that last name, is also out. So Virgil Green will be the only guy there, and he'll get um, a decent number of looks probably with Denver. They have a really good slate of games coming up for a passing offense, right? They go to Miami, then they play at home against the Jets before traveling to Indy. So it's a good it's a good set of matchups in terms of passing defenses that they're going against. But again, Simeon struggles a lot on the road. So um, he's a decent streaming option for the next couple of weeks. I just would probably temper expectations against Miami. If you see uh, you know, him play really well against Miami and getting uh, chemistry with the receivers and the tight ends over there, then I'd say, you know what, he'll be a good streaming option for week 14 when they're at home against the Jets. So, Paxton Lynch out. We move over to Jameis Winston, the shoulder injury, obviously, that's kept him out of the last couple of games. They had positive MRI results. Right now, I don't know if this is just coach speak, but they're saying he has a good chance of suiting up for Sunday. They play at Green Bay. Um, this Packers defense has been very, 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 very poor against the pass. They have allowed four of their last five quarterbacks to throw for more than 295 yards. The only dude that didn't do that was Joe Flacco. In Winston's six full games of quarterback this year, right? He left early in a few of them, so I don't count those. He had six full games where he played quarterback in 2017. He's thrown for 325 or more yards in four of those six. So in my opinion, if he is close, you know, if he's going to play and they're saying they're going to let him throw, if he's close to 100%, then I'm... I'm putting Winston in that QB1 conversation, right? Top 10, top 12 ranking because this Green Bay defense has been terrible. And when Winston's playing, you know, the team hasn't been great. He's been overthrowing receivers, but he's putting up the numbers nonetheless. And that's all we care about in fantasy football. So if Winston goes, you could fire him up. It's also a big boost for a guy like Mike Evans, who's kind of been struggling as of late. Next quarterback, we got C.J. Bethard, the rookie for the Niners. It's already been announced that Jimmy Garoppolo will be the starter for, um, for week 13. Right, the rookie left the end of week 12 against Seattle. He has like a knee problem and a hip, uh, knee contusion and a hip strain. Jimmy Garoppolo came in through like two or three passes, one of them for a touchdown. Now, I would say like, I, I like, 
I talked about it in my waiver wire sheet. Uh, Marquise Goodwin was one of my favorite ads as wide receiver for the last couple of weeks, and he's been putting up solid numbers, but I'm afraid that that chemistry was only with Bethard. I mean, it might be with Garoppolo as well, uh, but before I suit up anything on the outside, right, in terms of Goodwin or in terms of Kill or anyone you want to get in the passing offense, I'm probably going to pull the reins back a little bit, but I do think it's good news for Carlos Hyde because the offense will probably run a little bit more smoothly, although Bethard had the running game aspect to him, so I don't think it's much of a, a an impact on... Uh, the 49ers offense overall. We have Jay Cutler missed week 12 with a concussion. Matt Moore stepped in through for 215 yards, touched down two interceptions against the Pats last week. Now, they play Denver in week 13, so it's not like you want to start either of these guys, and I'm more concerned with how it impacts the rest of the team. Now, if Cutler was back, I would say Devontae Parker is not a bad play. He's coming off the worst game of his season in week 12, where he caught like one of three targets for five yards, I think it was. But they're going to play against Denver, right? But Aqib Tlaib is going to be out, right? He's serving a suspension for, for snatching the chain off Michael Crabtree. So that defense is going to be a little less scary. They're also missing Pico, one of their top defensive linemen on the year. I don't expect Miami to be good, but if Cutler's in the lineup, right, he... he Parker's been super consistent as a fantasy player as long as Cutler's been the quarterback there. So I, I throw him in. If not, then Jarvis Landry would be my favorite play there. I would probably consider both of them wide receiver threes regardless. It's not someone I'm like jumping in, into my lineup, but I'm not necessarily scared away from either of these guys. Another guy with a concussion, Devonta Freeman. At this point, I, I mean, as a Falcons fan, I love Freeman. I love Coleman too, right? But at this point, right, through this point of the season, like, are we that sure that Devonta Freeman's that much better than Tim and Coleman? Freeman's missed the last two games with this concussion, and uh, Coleman has been, you know, Coleman's turned the front door up. 40 touches over the last two weeks, 155 yards, three total touchdowns in two weeks. That's four rushing touchdowns in the last three weeks combined. He is sitting now as uh, running back 12 right now in fantasy overall on the year. Week 13, they got a tough game, right? Minnesota travels to Atlanta to play the Falcons at home. So if, I mean, if Freeman, if Freeman's out, like there's, I don't care who they're playing. They could be playing against multiple defenses at once. I'm putting Coleman in as an RB1, like locked and loaded. If Freeman comes back, it's going to be hard to trust either of them as anything more than an RB2, because again, they're going to split the carries. They'll probably both see somewhere between 12 and 15 touches. This Minnesota defense is allowing the second fewest fantasy points to the running back position on the year. Them splitting carries along with a very, 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 very hard matchup is um, I'm definitely not avoiding either one. I would play either the either of them in my lineup, but it's just something uh, that you need to kind of temper expectations there. But if Freeman's out, Coleman, surefire RB1. A couple of the running backs, we got Tymon, Aaron Jones. Both of these running backs have missed the last few games for Green Bay. They've completely missed the last two games. And three games ago was the game that they both left. They started, they were active, and they left the game with an injury. Open the door to this rookie, Jamal Williams, out of BYU, who's absolutely torn it up over the last couple weeks. Now, Montgomery did not practice at all last week. He's got this rib injury. He also dealt with a rib injury earlier in this season. Uh, so it's not a great sign for his week 13 status. He didn't practice at all. So he's going to have to practice, you know, in, in some sort of form this week in order for him to have any chance of suiting up on Sunday. Uh, Jones' initial, Aaron Jones' initial injury timetable was like three to six weeks, right? This game would put him at that three week mark, which means like best case scenario is he's returning this week. Worst case scenario, he's out for like another three or four weeks. So um, both of them are very questionable at best. If they miss, my mom's just calling me. You know, this reminds me of like being back in college. I forget to call my mom or text my mom for like five days at a time and she'll be like texting me like after the weekend's over. She'll be like, are you alive? Call me when you see this and I'll hit her back like two days later because I'm an asshole. But yeah, she's been doing that since I've been out here. Doing hood rat things with my friends and my mom gets worried about me as she should. She's a good mother. So I appreciate her for that. And I'll call you back moms after this damn video is taped. Anyways, back to where I was saying, hmm. So if we include week 10, right? Because they have the two missed games plus the game they, they left. Williams has has received nearly 23 touches a game in those three games, and he scored twice. So if they're both out again, I am considering Williams an RB1 for Week 13. They get a home game versus Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tampa Bay has been uh, very, very friendly to, to running backs over the last few weeks. We had last week, Tevin Coleman just ran over them for 97 rushing yards, two touchdowns. The week prior to that, Damian Williams, while splitting carries with Kenyon Drake, uh, racked up over 100 total yards 
And then we go back to week nine and Ingram and Alvin Kamara ran for like 6,000 yards combined. So definitely a beatable Tampa Bay front seven here. Jamal Williams is in for a huge workload again if Tymont and Aaron Jones both miss the game. So, you know, if people want to say he's an RB2, I, I would, there's not a lot of guys that I would play over him if he's the only back there in Green Bay. They are leaning on him heavily. Speaking of leaning on, we have Damian Williams on his shoulder. He suffer, suffered a dislocated shoulder. He's already been ruled out for week 13. He's reportedly supposed to miss a few weeks, like a multi-week absence, more than one game. That leaves Kenyon Drake as the featured back in Miami. They don't have anyone else on the roster because I forget what the other guy's name even was, to be honest with you, but he, he suffered a concussion too. So they're gonna have to call up guys from the practice squad. I just saw a report they were they were looking at, uh, who's the, oh, Jeremy Langford. I think he was working out for them, or they might sign him or something, whatever. It's going to be Kenyon, the Kenyon Drake show there in Miami. Now, they're going against this Broncos team, a very, very tough rush defense, at least in the beginning of the year and the middle of the year. If you look at what's happened as of late, they have not been good. They've given up nine total touchdowns to the running back position over the last four games. Nine touchdowns over the last four games. And as we've seen so far, right, Damian Williams and Kenyon Drake are both getting a lot of work in the passing game. With Williams out, Kenyon Drake's going to get the full complement of rushes, the full complement of receiving work out of the backfield. That's, you know, that's a, a recipe for success against this team who's allowing running backs to, to scorch them not only on the ground, but through the air as well. So Drake, for me, is, a, is an RB2 with pretty high upside, uh, just given the volume that he's going to have against this team. And uh, as I'll get into the defensive injuries, I'm doing that too as well. I'm gonna get into individual injuries for the defensive side of the ball, which will be interesting because it'll, it'll help you prepare for, uh, for some of your guys that are going against these defenses. Demata Pico, D lineman for the Broncos, has been one of the best run defenders uh, that they have this year, and he's been a big reason for their success, but he is out with a knee injury for at least the next one to two weeks, which is a big downgrade uh, for that Broncos defense, but it's an upgrade for Drake, so. Drake, nice RB2 play this year. I mean, this week. Doug Martin, concussed. Boy, got a conco. Left the Bucks week 12 game in the first half. Uh, the scraps were basically left with a combination between Quiz Rogers, uh, Charles Sims, and Peyton Barber. Quiz saw the majority of rushes, right? I think he had nine carries or something like that after Doug Martin left. Uh, but Peyton Barber was the one who was able to capitalize on two goal line rushes. He scored two touchdowns, even though he rushed for like seven yards on five carries. He got the important carries there. Sims was still playing on like 40% of the snaps, seeing a lot of passing down work. So if Martin's out, it's a backfield I'm completely avoiding, right? They're, they're playing against this Green Bay defense who have not been good against the run. They've given up the seventh most fantasy points to the running back position on the year. But if Martin's out, you have no idea who's gonna be the lead back, who's gonna get the, the passing work, who's gonna get the goal line touches. So I'm avoiding them at all costs. If Martin plays, he hasn't been good as of late, but I would probably be okay with him in, in my flex just because this Green, Bay, uh, this Green Bay rush defense is so, so friendly to the running back. BRBs right now, I gotta get my power raids. I gotta stay hydrated. Doing these goddamn videos is like playing a sport, bro. You know, get me out of breath. Let's move on to the wide receivers. We got Juju. Young boy Juju on a beat. Has that hamstring injury missed week 12. They're saying he has a chance to suit up for week 13, according to head coach Mike Tomlin, but he didn't practice at all last week. And, you know, those hamstring is one of those injuries that you could practice limited for for like weeks at a time and still not suit up. So the fact that he didn't practice at all last week says to me that it's probably less than 50% he plays either way. Keep your eye on reports for Juju. What's, what's more nerve-wracking as a Juju owner is not the fact that he's actually injured. It's probably the fact that him being injured opens the door back up for Martavis Bryant to kind of creep back into the, into the good graces of this coaching staff and Big Ben. And he took advantage of it last week, right? He, he caught four of his six targets for like 40 yards, and he scored a touchdown. So Juju stays on the outside, right? Martavis is going to keep trying to prove. And, you know, like the great Ari Gold once said, once a star, always a threat. You could be used that anywhere. You could use that in fantasy football. You could use that as a movie star. But that's the case with Martavis, right? We've seen him be a star before, so that upside is always there. He's always going to be a threat to the workload. Either way, the Steelers go against the Bengals, right? Division rivalry game, Monday Night Football. Uh, we're very aware of the Big Ben splits home versus away. There's been no difference in them this year. He is much worse away than he is at home. They're taking on um, the Bengals in Cincinnati on Monday Night Football. So the fact that they're away, plus the Bengals have been very, 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 very good against um, 
against fantasy wide receivers this year. They're allowing the third fewest fantasy points to opposing wide receivers. That tells me that like even if Juju suits up, I probably want I probably don't want to start Juju or Martavis Bryant as anything more than like a kind of like a desperate flex play. I'm okay with Martavis if Juju sits as like as a flex play. Um, Antonio obviously is a is a, an elite wide receiver. One doesn't the, I literally I don't even know why I just wasted my breath on that. But just saying, them being on the road, Cincinnati is a very good pass defense, so I, I'm a little nervous about Juju or Martavis. And then we have Amari Cooper, who not only suffered a concussion, but he has a minor ankle tweak. Head coach Jack Del Rio said he is fine after the Week 12 game, uh, but he's dealing with these two separate injuries. He could very well miss week 13 in Oakland versus the Giants, which would be a very, very good matchup for Cooper considering Janoris Jenkins is probably going to be out. Crabtree's already suspended for the next two games, which means that if Cooper plays, he's going to be a very good start this week because Crabtree obviously demands so many targets on his side. Now Cooper will get a lot of those. If he doesn't, that leaves like Seth Roberts, Cordell Patterson as, as like the top receivers on this team. I don't really consider either of them more than like a wide receiver three, four flex kind of option. Targets have to go somewhere, right? This team has thrown the ball more than 35 times a game. Derek Carr is putting up, he's not been great, but he's putting up 250 to 300 passing yards a game. They're gonna be throwing it a lot and they need someone to catch the ball. So if Crabtree and Cooper sit, you can throw Seth Roberts in there. He is the uh, third leading receiver in terms of targets, receptions, receiving yards on the team. He's playing in about 78 to 80% of the team's snaps this year, which is surprising to me. Cordell Patterson's only playing in about, I think it was like 40 to 45%. So Seth Roberts would be the de facto wide receiver one here in a really good matchup against the Giants. Do what you want with that. I'd say like it's as good as a chance of Seth Roberts having a big game as it would be Cordero Patterson because they'll both probably get around the same amount of playtime. Patterson probably a better playmaker, but uh, if Cooper's playing, I'm 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 okay with him as like my wide receiver too. There, Kelvin Benjamin. List says day to day somehow. I'm pretty sure there's like a 94% chance he's not going to play in Week 13. He has a torn meniscus. That probably sounds a lot worse than it than it actually is, but it's still not good. Like there's no, I like I can't imagine him playing in Week 13. Uh, it'd be a boost for Zay Jones, who's starting to become the wide receiver one that I kind of predicted him to be in the beginning of the year. Starting to really come on and be much better of a player than he was earlier in the season, but it's also a big boost for Charles Clay. I was looking at some of the numbers, some of the splits, which I'll put up right now. Clay has averaged nearly eight more PPR fantasy points a game this season in games that Benjamin wasn't playing than he was. There's five games that he was not playing, and... Uh, you can see Charles Clay is averaging eight fantasy points more, PPR points more than without, or than with Kelvin Benjamin. So it's a big boost for Charles Clay. Uh, Zay's numbers have been pretty much the same, whether or not Kelvin Benjamin was in the lineup. So Zay is a decent flex play. Charles Clay uh, is a top 10, top eight option for me at tight end this week. Uh, what other receivers? Damn, there's so many injuries this week. Robert Woods, you know, uh, we saw last week, right? He's out multiple weeks with a shoulder injury. We saw both Watkins and Cooper Cup Go off, be very, very good fantasy options against the Saints. Now, the Saints were without both Marshawn Lattimore and uh, uh, Ken Crowley, their top two cornerbacks. So it was an easy matchup for Jared Goff and these wide receivers to exploit. Robert Woods is going to be out again. Now, they're playing at home against the um, Arizona Cardinals. Cardinals have been very friendly to fantasy wide receivers, right? Top nine, they've given up the ninth most fantasy points to the wide receiver position. Now, Patrick Peterson is probably going to stay on Sammy Watkins, which means Cooper Cup should... I, I'm seeing Cooper Cup is like a high-end wide receiver two this week for me. Watkins, I'd be fine playing him as like a wide receiver three as well because Jared Goff is going to lean on these guys in the pass game, right? They don't have a lot of other weapons to go to outside of uh, Gurley coming out of the backfield. So uh, Cooper Cup is like a must start for me this week. And uh, I really like Watkins as well as a uh, as a flex play. Although he's going to get Patrick Peterson, I just think that anytime Sammy Watkins gets the opportunity, he he takes advantage of it. Um, Rashard Matthews hamstring, right? He missed he missed week twelve. He tweaked his hammy last week in practice on Thursday. Didn't practice Friday. Sat out their game um, in week twelve. Now this was like <clears throat> a perfect setup for Corey Davis, the first round top ten pick rookie to go off. He caught four balls for 39 yards. I'm like, bro, what the f fudge are you doing out there? This is your game to explode, right? They had a matchup against the Colts who have been getting killed. What else am I saying here? Like I write these blog posts and I just write the dumbest shit while I'm writing it. Like I wrote like BTW, I'm in the middle of listening to New Music Friday while I'm writing this. Kodak Black's new song, Codeine Dreamin'. <laughs> slaps, it does slap cheeks. Go listen to Codeine Dreamin' by Kodak Black. 
phenomenal. Anyways, Matthews, I believe he's listed as day-to-day, -day, but he's definitely questionable for week 13. We don't know if he's going to play or not. Hammy is something that can linger for a while. If he doesn't go, Davis will have, he'll be in another great spot. He'll be in another great situation matchup against this terrible Houston pass defense for him to light up the scoreboard and hopefully, you know, gain back the trust of the Titans or gain back trust of me as a fantasy player. I, I would fire him up as a high-end wide receiver three. A lot of upside here with Davis because of the matchup and because of uh, Shard missing, uh, missing time. So if, if Matthews goes, you know, it's possible he'll be less than 100%, but as he's been all year, he would be my preferred fantasy option as a wide receiver in Tennessee. Uh, Delaney Walker would also get a boost if Matthews is out. Last week, with Matthews out, he scored his first touchdown of the year, which is, like, unbelievable. For first touchdown of the year, but that's five straight games now of at least four catches and at least 63 receiving yards. So you're getting a really, really, really solid floor out of Walker, and now he has a ton, tons of upside. So he's a top five uh, option at tight end fantasy-wise this week with or without Rashard Matthews. And what else? Move over to a couple tight ends. We have Greg Olson, who finally came back from his foot, his broken foot that he suffered early in the year. Came back, ended up leaving the game again with another foot injury. You know, you figure that he fucked it up again and he's going to be done for the season. Turns out it's not that serious. Um, but his first game back, he didn't play very well. He caught one of four targets for 10 yards. He did have an end zone target, though. Uh, so it was good to see Cam looking his way, and it could have potentially been a much bigger day. That being said, though, they went into last week saying that it would be ideal if Greg Olson played 50% of the snaps. Now he comes back. They're already not trying to play him a ton, and he re-injures his foot. So I can't imagine that he comes back from this like re-injury and gets a full slate of snaps again. So I'm definitely going to be lower on Olsen than a lot of people, even though um, they have a good matchup. I think, who they play? They play the Saints. That's not a great matchup, but um, I don't really love Olsen. There's probably a lot of guys I would play over him at tight end this week. And we got fucking Jordan Reed with his hamstring, bro. He's like softer than a Chinese paper lantern. One of the ones from like James and the Giant Peach that he lights to get the little green worm and sets that shit. That's like Jordan Reed in, in paper lantern form. Still isn't practicing for the fourth straight week. He's going to miss week 13. And I know a lot of people are not going to want to start Vernon Davis after what he did to y'all on Thanksgiving. But y'all could be thankful for what he did the pro the previous weeks up to that. He's He's been a very good fill-in while Jordan Reed's missed his games, right? He's averaged like eight targets a game. He's putting up solid fantasy numbers. Last week, I get... I don't know what the hell happened last week, right? He's going against the Giants. It's like a premium matchup that he should have exploited and took advantage of. Said he shits the bed, gets you literally zero fantasy points. Doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but um, they're going against the Cowboys this this week, uh, the Cowboys have given up a touchdown to the opposing tight end in three of their last four games. It's a solid matchup for Vernon Davis to bounce back in. So I'm not hesitating to put him back in my lineup as a tight end one for the week. And now, something I haven't done this year, but I'm going to get into today, is uh, injuries on the defensive side of the ball. Because I've, I've seen so many top injuries or top players be injured on the defensive side of the ball that it's starting to take a big impact on how fantasy players on the offensive side of things turn out for the week. And we have Marshawn Lattimore, Ken Crawley. Marshawn Lattimore is arguably the best tight end, uh, cornerback in football this year, despite being a rookie. I missed his first game of the year last week with an ankle injury. He was spotted with a walking boot. So you're going to have to keep an eye on reports this week. And I, you know, like, I'm not a doctor, but if I had to guess, he's probably going to sit out another game. You also have Ken Crawley miss the game with an abdomen injury. There haven't been any news on the, their statuses for, uh, week, for week 13. We saw Jared Goff really smack that secondary around last week. He threw for like 354 yards, two touchdowns. So if those cornerbacks are out again, if one or both of them are out, Cam Newton should be able to take advantage of uh, of this secondary. And, you know, he, he'll get a boost as well as the rest of that, that offense. We have Rashawn Melvin, the Colts cornerback, 28, 28 years old, randomly emerged as their top cornerback with Vontae Davis kind of getting pushed out of the picture. He's been very solid this year. Uh, you look back at week 11, he shadowed Antonio Brown, let up just three catchers for 47 yards while covering him. Uh, he supposedly suffered a serious hand injury in week 12. He's going to miss some time. The Colts are already a defensive to attack, like from a fantasy offensive perspective. Um, but now this is just a team that you could absolutely go all in on. And they get the Jacksonville Jaguars next week. Marquise Lee will be a very, very solid wide receiver, too, for fantasy owners next week without Rashawn Melvin. And uh, look for Marquise Lee to bounce back in a big way. And I already kind of touched on this. Demata Pico, the Broncos D lineman, he is out for at least one or two, one or two weeks. He's been a big reason this Broncos run defense has been so solid. 
his his pro football focus grade up to date it's like 80.5 not that that means anything to you guys it's the highest graded um number he's had for his career in, in his 11 year career so he's playing as well as he's ever had right now for the broncos basically it's just a boost to ken and drake and that miami uh run offense and my Falcons, man, not only are we dealing with Devonta Freeman injury, but we had two of our top cornerbacks. We had Desmond Trufant and Brian Poole. Trufant's our cornerback one. He's one of the top cornerbacks in the NFL, in case y'all don't know that already. Brian Poole is probably our third best cornerback, but he's a slot cornerback. They both left the game last week. Desmond Trufant suffered a concussion. Brian Poole uh, escaped with a minor back injury, they're saying. There, I mean, there's a chance both of them miss next week. There's a chance both of them play next week. If they don't play next week, they'll have a very, very, very tough time stopping the Minnesota Vikings, right? Case Keenum is looking very good as of late. Kind of blows my mind that they won't commit to him. I guess it makes sense because Teddy Bridgewater's on a walk here, right? And before they hit the before they hit the off season, they're gonna want to see Teddy Bridgewater play, right? Because you look at the scenarios, they they need to see Teddy Bridgewater play because. Obviously, they're looking at him as the future uh, at quarterback as opposed to Case Keenum. If they don't see him play, then they don't know what they're getting. They're not going to be able to sign him to a, a long contract, but some desperate team will look to take on Teddy Bridgewater, even if it's for, like, even if it's for three years and, uh, I don't know, like $50 million or something like that. It's probably something the Vikings are not going to want to match if they don't see him play. So that's probably why they're not committing to Case Keenum. Either way, for Week 13, if Trufant and Brian Poole miss this game, it is a huge upgrade to Case Keenum. It's a huge upgrade to Stefan Diggs, and it's a huge upgrade to Adam Thielen, who runs the majority of his routes from the slot. He's already dominating, but now you take the top cornerback, the slot cornerback out of Atlanta, and uh, Thielen's going to be a monster. I already touched on this one, too. Janoris Jenkins is supposed to miss some time, if not the entire rest of the season, for the Giants, and uh, he's their top Cover cornerback on the outside. If he can't play, that's, again, uh, an, a boost for Amari Cooper if if he does suit up. With Crabtree already out, Cooper will be the de facto number one there. A couple other D linemen, a couple of the fat boys. We got William Hayes from the Dolphins. Per PFF, he is a top five run-stopping grade um, at the position. They weren't very good to begin with, but now they're going to be very, very, very bad without William Hayes. We saw what happened without him last week against the Pats. Deion Lewis ran for 115 yards on 12 carries. Their running backs and their wide receivers, the Patriots, combined for 200 rushing yards in week 12. 6.1 yards per carry. So they get the Broncos this week who, you know, they haven't been great on the ground by any means, but it's an upgrade for Devontae Booker. It's an upgrade for C.J. Anderson uh, with William Hayes out of the lineup. I would say they're both probably flex plays at best because you don't know what kind of split you're going to get with them. I like Booker more than I like C.J. Anderson at this point, though. Lastly, Leonard Floyd, the Bears, D lineman. The Bears entered this year basically as an underrated defense, right? They're like uh, a team that, like, you know they're not going to be a good team. They're also uh, a defense that has a lot of potential to, to step up and be one of the top defenses in the league. They've been ravaged by injury. Uh, a lot of things have just not gone their way. Leonard Floyd is the next one to... Uh, take a hit to this defense. He's placed on the IR on Friday. Finished the season with five and a half sacks through 10 games. That's really good for a sophomore. You look at last week, the Bears were killed by the Eagles, um, both through the air, 244 yards, three touchdowns, and on the ground, 176 yards, 5.3 yards per carry. So if, uh, if you were ever looking for a defense to attack, the Bears have quickly become one of those defenses that you can start a lot of fantasy players against. So that is that, my friends. As always, you know, the, my wide receiver cornerback notable matchup sheet will drop Thursday morning. I will email that out to anybody that is on the newsletter. So again, go sign up on the website and we will move into some dudes, you know, my top starts and my top sits of the week. So it's actually the next day, filling that first part on Tuesday. Now it's Wednesday. We did Taco Tuesday last night. Let me tell you, man, they know how to make some goddamn tacos out here. They had filet mignon, lobster tacos. I had a couple of both. We fully sent it last night. I shouldn't have done that. I gotta stop going out on weeknights. And I also wanna say, all right, so we're gonna get into some guys I love. Since I did the first part of this video yesterday, a few, few, few of the newer reports, which I'll, I guess I'll touch on as I'm doing this, came out today, of course, like injury updates. Devonta Freeman's cleared to play. Uh, James Winston will be starting for the Bucks. So just keep that in mind from what I've said yesterday. First guy I love this week is Philip Rivers, quarterback for the Chargers. The Chargers. Go Chargers. Going against Cleveland. He's only 46% starter right now. 
He has a great matchup against these Browns, right? Uh, Rivers and the Chargers are rolling right now. They are rolling, 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 rolling. Uh, wait, who's sent? Limb Biscuit. Limb Biscuit would be proud right now of the Chargers, put it that way. He's averaging 307 passing yards per game over his last three games, has seven passing touchdowns in that span, multiple touchdown passes in each of those last three games. The Browns are not good at defending quarterbacks in terms of fantasy purposes. They are allowing the seventh most fantasy points to the quarterback position in 2017. Um, I just I just think it's an easy spot here for Rivers. It's an easy start here. Uh, you know, their defense is already without Jamie Collins at linebacker. They're missing one of their top line rushers now in Emmanuel Ogba. Ogba? I'm not really sure how to say that. I know one of my boys, one of my subscribers from Cleveland, you're my favorite Cleveland subscriber, Ricardo. Help me out there. I don't know how to say that. Uh, Emmanuel Ogba, whatever. Um, See, I just think it's a very easy matchup for Rivers. I would definitely try to start him if you could. And, uh, you know, Josh Gordon coming back. Maybe there's some shootout potential there. Definitely not really from the Brown side, but, you know, it, it can't hurt. It can't hurt to have Josh Gordon back in the game. So, Phillip Rivers, get him in your lineups. The next quarterback that I also love, which I already kind of talked about, was Jameis Winston coming back against this Packers team. Um, he is cleared to play. He's going to be going. So, everything I kind of talked about uh, in regards to Jameis Winston during the injury um, updates earlier in the video that goes for him so love him I'm not going to talk about any wide receivers because as I always mention the wide receiver cornerback notable matchup column will come out tomorrow so subscribe to the newsletter if you're not already on my homepage, and you'll be able to check that out running backs the the Patriots duo of Dean on Lewis and Rex Burkhead I absolutely love them this week I started both of them in my E-Town get down league last week they did not disappoint Lewis racked up uh, 115 rushing yards on like 12 carries. Burkhead got into the end zone two time. You know, they're they're going to be playing at Buffalo. Uh, we see James White basically phased out of the picture now. He's he's played significantly less snaps than these other two running backs in each of the previous three weeks. Uh, so it really is the Lewis and Burkhead show there with Gillisley obviously being a healthy scratch for the last few games. Um, I'm fine playing either of them, and I'm fine playing both of them, which I will probably be doing in one of my leagues. So, I love both of them in the spot. The The Bills are allowing the third most fantasy points to the running back position on the year. They are allowing the single most rushing touchdowns per game to the running back position. They're allowing 1.2 rushing touchdowns a game to the running backs of the opposing team. So, uh, it, it's almost a guarantee that one or both of them are going to get into the end zone at one point during this game. So, they're going to be heavy favorites. They're going to be utilizing the ground game a lot. It wouldn't surprise me to see both of them get in between 12 and 15 touches and um, rack up anywhere from 60 to 100 total yards, scrimmage yards, and uh, better than a coin flip to get into the end zone. So I like both of them a lot playing at Buffalo this week. Um, and then you have Samaja Ryan, Alex Collins, Jamal Williams, all expected to get very, 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 very heavy usage as they've been getting the last few weeks, but they're still kind of underestimated as running backs. I'm not really going to dive into all three of them, but you need to get all three of them into your lineups. I actually think uh, I saw a report like an hour ago that Aaron Jones was practicing and he's back today. Let me check that for you while I'm on here, which would be interesting if Jones and Williams were active, Ty Montgomery not active. Could have sworn on Twitter I saw somewhere it said Aaron Jones was practicing today, and now on Roto World it says he's not. Actually, let me Twitter search it for it. That's another great use of Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, first of all, if you're on Twitter, make sure you're following my account. It's just Nick underscore BDGE. If you're not on Twitter, I suggest you get on there solely for the purpose of fantasy football, because that's probably that's probably the best platform to to take in fantasy football info because it's a lot of quick hitting stats. It's a lot of like really good takes on Twitter that you don't have to, you know, it's not a lot of long hitting content that you need to take to stay on there. And you could also search for things like right now, Aaron Jones into the search bar and I can see all the latest in the top posts from it. Aaron Jones was on the field today for the first time since November 12th knee injury. Um, so he could be on the early end. It says they both won't practice, but it says he should be returning this week. This is, uh, they're all conflicting reports. Now he did practice. Okay, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. If he does play, then this backfield might get a little muddy, but Jamal Williams has been playing very well, so I would still imagine that Jones coming back from this injury uh, won't get a full slate of snaps. If anything, he will probably be the lesser part of that running back duo there in Green Bay. So I would say if both of them play, Jamal Williams definitely gets bumped down to probably an RB3, and I, I 
Aaron Jones a pretty desperate flex play. I'm not, I'm not looking to um, throw him back in my lineup anytime soon. And then we have a couple tight ends that I like. Jared Cook, um, he's in an obvious spot here. I mean, despite what they did to Vernon Davis last week, you know, holding him to zero fantasy points, the Giants have been an absolute gaping hole for fantasy tight ends this year. So with Oakland playing the Giants, we have Crabtree out. He's suspended. We have Amari Cooper questionable for this game. If, uh, you know, if Cooper doesn't play, then Jared Cook is the best pass catcher, basically, on the Oakland Raiders offensive side of the ball. Uh, even if Cooper does play, Cook is still a bet for six to eight targets in this game, if not more. Um, he has at least five targets in five straight games. So, you know, the volume is already there, and now there's going to be even more opportunity to go Cook's way in a very good matchup. So, Jared Cook is definitely a guy I want on my team um, for, for week 13. And then we have Jack Doyle, tight end Indy. They're playing Jacksonville. Uh, I'm not sure people realize how good Jack Doyle has been for the Colts as of late. It's not even as of late, over like the last six weeks. So he has caught at least six passes. At least six passes he's caught in five of their last six games. That's like PPR gold right there. He is tight end six, fantasy tight end six, since returning from his week five absence. So from week six on, he is tight end six since that point. Oh, listen to these numbers. Over his last three road games... Last three road games, he is averaging over 11 targets, 9 receptions, 78 receiving yards, and has scored in two of the three games. 11 targets, 9 receptions, 78 yards, and two of three games with a touchdown. Doyle is on fire on the road, for whatever reason that may be, um, and they are going on the road against Jacksonville this week. Jacksonville, their weakness, if you want to call it that, in their passing defense is against the tight ends. They're allowing the 12th most fantasy points to the tight end position on the year. Um, they're coming off a game where they just let up a 472 one line to Ricky the God Seals Jones. If RSL, or RSJ could do it, my boy Jackie Doyle damn well can get it done. So, Jack Doyle, light him up this week. If I had to choose either Cook or Doyle, that's actually very close for me. I would probably pick Cook just based on the opportunity and the opponent there, but I like both of them as a top 10 play for sure. Guys that I hate this week, Matthew Stafford, easily number one. Um, he's playing at Baltimore on the road. And I feel like people are going to disregard that matchup and just be like, Stafford's playing so well, I'm just not going to sit him, right? Don't do that. He is on a hot streak. He's averaging 316 passing yards over his last six games. That's not a small sample size. And he's thrown multiple touchdowns in five of those six games. But I'm still telling you to sit Matt Stafford this week. This Baltimore pasty is no joke. Other than Jacksonville, they are allowing the least amount of fantasy points to the quarterback position in 2017. They have not allowed a single quarterback to throw for more than 255 yards the entire year. I'm going to repeat that again for you. They haven't allowed a quarterback to throw for more than 255 yards against them this year. Only two quarterbacks, we're in week 13, people. Only two quarterbacks have thrown for multiple touchdowns in a game against Baltimore. Like, this defense is very, very legit. Uh, over their last five games, the Ravens defense has posted a 2-9 to nine touchdown to interception ratio. So they've picked off quarterbacks nine times and only, only have allowed two passing touchdowns over their last five games. Uh, they have 11 sacks over the last three games. The Lions have given up 10 in their last three games. So it's a mismatch on the front. It's a mismatch on the back end. This is not going to be a good game for Stafford in my humble-ass opinion. So Stafford's going to be under pressure a lot, you know, led by Jimmy Smith on the outside. I think these cornerbacks are going to lock up the Detroit group of receivers. So... I'm all out on Stafford this week. Uh, I already talked about Big Ben when I talked about Juju Smith. Big Ben on the road, obviously his splits are not good. He's averaging about 23 and a half fantasy points per game at home versus like seven, 16 and a half to 17 away. Uh, we've always known that was the case with Big Ben, the home versus away split. So I'm staying away from Ben this week on the road at Cincy. It's a very tough matchup for Ben. Um, not only is he on the road, but the Cincy defense is very, very strong against the pass. So I actually want to pull up his splits over the last couple of years against Cincinnati while we're on the subject right now. So, um, you know, again, without a tough matchup on the road, probably without Juju Smith-Schuster, it's, it's just not, it's not, a, it's not a time that I want Ben in my lineup. And let me just pull up the stats against uh, 
Cincinnati. How you doing? Last three years, 2015 to 2017, his splits versus Cincinnati, 23 fantasy points per game not playing Cincinnati, 17.9 fantasy points per game when playing Cincinnati. Uh, let's see when he is on the road. Wow, it's even worse. When he's on the road against Cincinnati, it's only about 15 and a half fantasy points a game for Big Ben. So, again, just another point. I'm staying away from Ben. You can always look at these splits, the ones that I that I put on the screen, right, where I, uh, you know, it's a tool that, that Rotoviz actually offers for free. So, it's, it's just called, go on Google, type in Game Splits app, Game Splits app, APP, and then Rotoviz. So it'll probably be the first thing that pops up on Google. And you can mess around with it. I'm not going to do a fucking tutorial on it right now. But um, it's pretty easy to sim uh, figure out. And you could look at player splits uh, on the road, at home, certain years, uh, the over-under, the point spread while another player is playing. So like Big Ben, or like Vonta Parker, when Jay Cutler's playing versus when he's not playing. A lot of cool tools you could look at. Uh, really, really, really awesome app by Rotoviz. I'm glad that they offer it for people for free because a lot of their other shit is not free. So um, that's that, and those are two quarterbacks I am absolutely staying away from in week um, 13. Move over to some running backs that I'm staying away from. I'm basically staying away from anyone on the Buccaneers backfield. Um, I also hate DeMarco Murray this week. This, it's been the story all year. I mean, it's back and forth. He has a good game, and then he looks terrible compared to Derrick Henry. He has a good game, then he looks bad compared to Derrick Henry. Now they're going against the Texans team. The Texans have, while you know their defense has been terrible in the passing sense, they've been very, very good against opposing running backs. So I think DeMarco Murray, I, I, I think this is when the Titans finally kind of give way to Derrick Henry taking over that backfield. Not by like a 70-30 carry split or anything like that, but I think the snaps start to slowly favor Henry instead of DeMarco Murray. Like all year we've seen Murray dominate snaps like 70% to 30%. I think it's getting closer to 50-50. And I think Henry eventually pursues you know, the lead in that backfield. It's not a good matchup for either of them, to be honest with you. So I don't really like DeMarco Murray's anything more than like a, a, a low flex play here. I mean, say what you want about Hunt, man. I still want him in my lineup as, as I mean, he's not the, obviously he's not the elite RB2, uh, RB1 that we, that we know him for, but another backfield that I just want to stay away from altogether, um, at least for this week, is Philadelphia's. Because you don't know what you're getting there. You, you just have no idea on a week-to-week -week basis. With J.H.I. there, you can get excited about him. I'm sure he's a talented guy, and he's busted a few good runs in his first couple games with the Eagles. But he's at eight carries, seven carries, five carries last week. LeGarrette Blount dominated the work. They're going to be at Seattle. They're giving up the fifth fewest fantasy points to running backs on the year. It's just not a good matchup. It's not a good situation. The opportunity might not be there. Um, you know, obviously his offense is rolling right now. They're a great team. This is just not, you know, um, their coach, that Peterson, is just not a guy who utilizes one backfield. He never features a back. They're utilizing Ajay, they're utilizing Blunt, they're utilizing Corey Clement. So it, you never know what you're gonna get there. Because they're going to play in Seattle against this tough run D, I really don't see either of them as more than an RB, you know, like a low end RB2, probably more of a flex play option. I mean, I, I'd be okay playing either of them in my flex probably, um, but, I would prefer someone else to get in there if you could. So it's a lot of a lot of running backs where it's just murky situations still. You don't really know who's going to get the bulk of the carries or who's going to you know play on which set of downs. Who's going to get the goal line carries? Who's going to get the passing down work? Things like that. Those are a lot of backfields I want to stay away from because for the most part, those backfields, the teams that have those backfields, are also playing against stiff competition. So the combination of those two things does not bode well. But. Uh, let's move over to some tight ends. Who did I who did I not like this week? Oh, well, I talked about Greg Olson, I guess, already. Coming back from the foot injury. Um, do we know if he's going to play? He did not practice on Wednesday, so he is definitely a question mark for week 13. If he does play, I'm avoiding him because, you know, they didn't really plan to use him that much. Last week, re-injured the foot. You don't know what you're getting here. So there's a lot more there's a lot more tight ends that I do like this week than uh, I, I dislike. Tyler Croft is a guy that I put on my waiver wire sheet every single week, and I think he's been a good streamer, a good plug-in week to week. But I would definitely stay away from him. 
because Pitt has been very good against the pass, especially against tight ends. They've allowed the third fewest fantasy points against the tight ends. Croft has been so good as a streaming option because when he doesn't get the yards, he gets the touchdowns. Pittsburgh is not giving up any touchdowns to the tight end position, and his floor as a yardage guy is awful, right? 14 yards last week, 12 the week before that, four yards the week before that. So uh, I'm staying away from Croft. But there are a lot of good tight end options that I do like this week. I know I'm kind of past that section. But, I mean, between Delaney Walker, Evan Ingram, uh, Jared Cook, J even Jason Witten, Jack Doyle, Hunter Henry at Cleveland, Vernon Davis again at Dallas, there's a lot of guys on that borderline. One of them might be available in your league. So, um, oh, even Cameron Bray, his numbers with Winston as opposed to without Winston are so much higher. So I know he's kind of falling off the bandwagon. He's only owned in 61% of leagues. Um, but he, you know, he's a monster when Winston is in the lineup. So if you could grab him, which I'm seeing right now, he's actually available in one of my leagues, but I already have Delaney Walker starting there. He is someone that you could probably sneak in there, and he's, he's like a sneaky bet to finish in the top 10, top 12 this week since Jameis Winston is going to be playing. And, uh, you know, I don't want to wrap, I don't want to take up any more of your guys' time. I know this has probably already been like a 45 minute to an hour episode. We hit a lot of the key injuries and those key injuries are like, if, if you guys only skip to the players that affect your team, a lot of the injuries that I talk about, if I have one specific player, I usually hit on multiple players within that team and like the team they're going against and things like that. So I would rewatch the whole thing if you just skip to the players that you only keen in on that are on your team or something like that. But, uh, but that's gonna wrap up this episode. I will, I'll do a league recap next week of my fantasy leagues when the playoffs start because, I don't know, I'd rather just talk about it when the regular season wraps up. That is the video. Please give it that thumbs up if you enjoyed. Real quick, here's a little clip from, uh, from what I've been working with in Cali thus far. My boy bought a drone the day before Cyber Monday. Really expensive one, so we've been flying around the area that we live in right now. Really dope stuff. Check that out. Yeah, so that's going to be the video. Wrap it up. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. Give the video a thumbs up and I will see you. I actually probably won't be on live stream because I'm heading up to LA this weekend for a concert and I don't know if I'm going to be back by Sunday or not. So possibility of not having a live stream. Either way though, sign up for the newsletter so I can get you that wide receiver cornerback matchup sheet tomorrow and I'll see y'all whenever I see y'all. Peace.